Next, we have uh, Alicia and Sandra for the documentation working group. <laughs> hey, I'll turn on my camera. You can see my just rolled out of bed face. And, and please uh, do a short <laughs> intro as well, since uh, you were not able to join us at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm Alicia Cozine. Um, I am the lead technical writer for Ansible documentation at Red Hat. And um, yeah, was a systems administrator before this and an Ansible user and um, a, a huge fan as well as now a, an employee. Um, all right, so I apologize. It's awfully early for me. Um, throw questions at me, but I'm just gonna give you a short rundown of um, some things the docs team and the docs working group have uh, been doing lately. Uh, the first one, and I think most of you probably have already seen this, is um, a, we, we did split off Ansible core documentation from Ansible the package, that is Ansible with collections included. Um, there are now two different doc sites and I will drop those links in the chat just so. So this is the standard Ansible docs everybody knows and loves. Um, that has the collections index in it uh, and all of the collections documentation. And then we do a separate site now for Ansible core. So the only collection in the collections index for Ansible core is uh, ansible.builtin. Um, because you get those, those modules for free uh, when you install core. This, was, this split was basically to um, make sure that users who are building their own by using Ansible core and then adding collections on top of it um, one by one could find the exact version of Ansible core that they were using because the, the maintenance windows are different between Ansible core and Ansible. And if you look at the, the version selector dropdown on those two websites, you will notice that um, you have different options. So for Ansible the package, we're only supporting whatever is latest plus 2.9 and then Devel. For Ansible core, we're sticking to the standard um, sunsetting schedule. So it's whatever the, the, the most recent plus two before that plus devel. Um, you'll notice that if you, if you look in the Ansible core dropdown, there's no option before 2.10 because obviously 2.9 was not Ansible core. So it's a little weird now, but as we move forward um, and keep releasing new versions, those dropdowns will be accurate for which versions of which thing are maintained. Um, and as you can see, we duplicated most of the content, which is not a great SEO practice, um, meaning it makes things harder to search from the open internet um, on the search platform of your choice. But it does mean that there's an integrated user experience. Um, so if you're on that doc site and you want to look at um, general user documentation, you get everything for the version that you're looking at. Um, so that may be changing. And I think maybe Gundalo talked about that earlier with the, the uh, community documentation. We may be pulling that out. And if so, it would disappear from both of those other two doc sites, um, which brings challenges of its own. But um, yeah. Uh, Ansible core, Ansible base. Yes, we 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 thought about that, and then we thought, you know what? No, <laughs> we're just not gonna have a third doc site because my brain can't handle it. Um, all right, what else have we been working on? Breadcrumbs. Um, let's see. So if you look at the collections, we'll use. Community Docker. Okay. So if you look at page like 
this. Dun, dun. Yeah, it's all random, yeah. Um, if you look at a page in the package docs that covers a particular um, module or anything else within a collection, and you scroll all the way to the top, depending on your browser, you may need to scroll that main window up. You will see that we now have um, breadcrumbs. So on the far right of that top line, you see the, the current module that you're looking at with a short description. Above that, you see the collection, community.docker. Above that, you see a list of collections in that namespace. So this is particularly handy um, for community, for example. You can click on that link and you get everything from community.awx, uh, sorry, AWS to community.zabbix. Um, this works for all namespaces, although obviously it's not equally use useful in all namespaces. There may only be one collection in certain namespaces. Um, but this does give you uh, an easy way to navigate around um, and, and find related collections. Um, so this has rebuilt uh, the last of the easily possible index pages. So this, this was some feedback that we got loud and clear <coughs> from the docs survey back in December um, that people really missed those old index pages of modules. Um, we have now rebuilt the all modules index page and we built this new system based on the collection hierarchy. Um, ah, thank you, Felix. Um, so there's a link there to the, the all index, uh, the all modules index uh, now in the chat. Um, the only piece of the old functionality we have not recreated was there used to be the modules by type indices. So there was, for example, the index of database modules, and that gave you all the different database types. Um, that might be possible to recreate if we started adding metadata here and there. Um, I think that will probably be on this coming, the next version of the survey <laughs> to see if that's something people really, 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 really want, because that would be um, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> you didn't know this was going to be an annual thing, huh? Um, yeah, we are planning to redo the docs survey in December. So hopefully we'll have year over year um, and be able to track our progress or lack thereof, if that's the case. Um, so uh, yes, so we will ask about those index pages. But my guess is that the the collection index pages and the all modules index page recreate enough of the old functionality that people um, will be happy enough. I hope so. Um, let's see, scenario guides. So I don't know how many folks here have ever used the scenario guides. Um, I'm going to look at virtualization. OK, so these are content that, um, whoops, okay, why did that not work? There we go. Um, this is content that existed on the old doc site before I started, and um, we didn't quite know what to do with at first, so we sort of put it in this little section on its own called Scenario Guides. Um, this is uh, technology-specific documentation. And by that, I mean it's documentation of using Ansible for or with specific technologies. And right now, we have three um, topics, if you will. So there's uh, virtualization and containerization. There's uh, public clouds. And there's network platforms. Um, in the new collections ecosystem, this content really belongs in collections. And so we have been working toward creating the infrastructure uh, 
and moving the content. Um, this is still a work in progress, but that is the plan. Um, and I will give a double shout out here to Felix Fontaine, who created both the uh, breadcrumbs and index page code, and also created the um, scaffolding that is letting us start that move of the scenario guides over to collections as a huge bonus allows collection maintainers to add documentation of their choice into their collection. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an example to show you yet because we haven't made an Ansible package release that includes the updated versions of the collections that will use this technology and actually publish it out to docs.ansible.com. But it is coming. Um, look for that. I think next week is our next point release. Um, and the last thing on my checklist here. Week. Whoops, what? I think it's this week. It's mm. every three weeks, so it should be this week. Hmm. Okay. I think so too, yeah. Uh, no, Rick, Rick, Rick is our release manager. He says next week. That's Ansible Core. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Ansible Core. All right, so week. this week. Um, no, it should be it, I think, it, but, um, Okay. I, I, uh, it, when the next release comes out, you will, you will see this exciting development. Um, obviously, I don't know when that is, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, look for it. And um, as time goes on, we'll be moving more and more of that scenario guide content. For anybody here who maintains content in Ansible, Ansible that relates to a technology like this. Um, be aware that we will start uh, shutting down pull requests so that we don't end up with phantom pull requests on Ansible Ansible for content that has moved to a collection. Um, so it may get a little messy for a little while, and then hopefully it will all be settled into collections and everyone will know where to maintain that type of content. All right. Last item on my list is the Sphinx theme. So Ansible documentation has been using um, a, a, a standard, using and um, somewhat modifying a standard Sphinx theme. Um, and we are, thanks to Sviat, who I think is here. I don't see him. Yep. Anyway. Yep. Oh, yay. Um, we are uh, almost ready to merge in and start using a, um, a stand, uh, an, an Ansible theme. So we will have our own theme. We will maintain it ourselves. And um, it will be available for drop-in use. So if you maintain a collection and you want to, um, especially if, if you're maintaining one that's not in Ansible the package and you want to publish your docs, um, oh, yes, there's the link to it. Thank you. Um, you can use the Ansible theme, and it will come out looking and feeling just like the Ansible documentation. Um, so I think that's it, unless I've forgotten major things. Um, yes, already used by Molecule and Ansible Lint. So we have adoption already, which is awesome. Um, Questions. I can't remember how long I was supposed to take, but I think I've gone pretty short, which probably means I've been talking too fast. Sorry. Um, any questions on the docs, on our infrastructure, on um, scenario guides or collections docs or anything that I've spoken about or something new? How can people help? What, what are you looking for from the community? Um, biggest place for help right now is um, reviews on open PRs. Uh, super helpful when people post a, hey, this this looks good to me, or um, even better, you know, specific, like, I like the way this PR would change this thing, whatever it is. Um, we're down, down, yesterday we were at 87 open docs PRs on Ansible Ansible, which isn't bad. Um, but given that a lot of the documentation work has moved into collections now, I would love to see it, see, you know, merges and, and if necessary, 
closing uh, PRs that were not going to merge, but I would love to see that get down under 75, maybe under 50, um, because we, we don't want to leave good contributions behind. But unfortunately, um, we're all quite busy, and sometimes we miss things. And then once they get stale, uh, sometimes it's hard for us to go back. I do look uh, pretty regularly at the PRs sorted by latest updated or most recently updated. Um, so if folks do put reviews on PRs, they will pop to the top of my list. Um, and also, anyone who wants to come to the documentation working group, we will probably do a short meeting today. It's every it's every Tuesday. Uh, we meet in the new IRC channel, uh, which my brain is not coming up with the name of, but I expect you've talked about it before. Um, and yes, it begins right at the end of the contributor summit time frame. So again, brain not fully awake yet. Uh, so I don't know what that is in UTC, but at the moment that this ends is when the, thank you, Felix, Libera chat, chat Libera, li Libera. <laughs> um, anyway, please join us. Uh, anyone is welcome to put a an agenda item. So if you have a PR that you're thinking, hey, yeah, she's been talking about PRs getting stale. Mine has been sitting out there for a long time and nobody's giving it any love. Um, add it to our agenda, which I just posted the agenda in the chat. Um, if you have issues, same thing. Uh, if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. If you have criticisms, we'd love to hear that too. Uh, the only way we know <clears throat> what's going on in the community, what people want, is um, if folks tell us. So please, come to the Docs Working Group. We're, we're known as the dogs. <laughs> My little joke. Um, and uh, yeah, the more the merrier. So join the pack. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, yes, we'll share all these links to the different issues and um, the meeting information and things like that um, after the event. So now it's time for another break. Since we had a longer break just now, let's take a short one so we can resume at the uh, planned time on the agenda. So we'll take a 10-minute break, and uh, we'll talk about execution environments when we get back. Thanks. Okay, um, welcome back to Ansible Contributor Summit. Uh, our last, one of our last sessions will be on execution environments with the community package with uh, Shane and Matt. Shane and Matt, are you? Hello, I'm here. I don't Wait. know if Matt is on the call, but I can go ahead. Um, okay, please. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, I'm Shane. Um, you might have seen me around if you are an AWX user. I've been on the tower team for uh, about five and a half years at this point, I think, kind of working um, in the shadows here. But um, today I'm going to talk about a new concept and a couple of new tools that we've been working on for a while. Um, I, have, I didn't have quite enough time to prepare for this, so I'm gonna kind of repurpose some presentations and some demos that I've given before, and I'll try to kind of go quickly because I only have 20 minutes and I can talk all day about this. But um, I'll go ahead and just share my screen and jump in. Can you all see this? Yes. Cool. So um, this was a talk I gave like last November or whenever, the um, Ansible Fest was. And some of the content um, I'm going to skip quickly through because I think you're more technical than a lot of the audience was at that event. Um, and some of it's changed, and I'll kind of show you the, the current state of things right after I blow through all of this content. So um, basically, execution environments um, are container engines, or container images, sorry, uh, waking up, haven't had tea or coffee yet. Um, they're container images that contain everything needed in order to run Ansible. Uh, so 
I guess first I'll just kind of touch on what it looks like uh, in the present day to run Ansible at scale in production. I usually start out with someone writing developer content, you know, your playbooks, your roles, your plugins, blah, blah, blah. Um, you then have to think about what that is going to look like when you need to run it in production. So maybe a help desk ticket, maybe you patch the servers yourself. Uh, then you're going to have to test it out, um, make sure that your code works, all the dependencies are there. Um, might require you to go back and forth multiple times. Then you basically have to go through that process every time that you write more content or add dependencies. So, ta-da. Um, we're going to be introducing, or we already have at um, Ansible Fest introduced this concept, but um, in the coming months, they will um, become uh, available for usage inside of uh, the product that we sell. If you're an AWX user, um, they're already there. Um, you can use them. Uh, I don't probably don't need to go over what a collection looks like, but um, let's skip forward, look at this example playbook. Uh, ignore this red hat dot open shift. We'll just call that like Kubernetes dot core. And this playbook, uh, I don't need to tell you what a module looks like. Um, oh, here I kind of pause for a minute and go into what containers look like. I probably don't need to do that here, but just in case anyone on the call isn't familiar with it, what, what it looks like to run a container. Here I'm showing um, pulling this universal base image uh, from Red Hat's registry. Uh, I'm running the who am I command inside of it. You can see I'm root inside of the container. Um, here's what it looks like to build your own image. Um, this is a container file, uh, which is a name that Podman um, looks for. If you use Docker, you know about Docker files. But basically, this is how you declare a parent image. And then here, we're basically just doing a simple override to illustrate what it looks like to modify a base image and instructing the new image that we're building to run under the app user. So I'm just showing here the result of making that change. Uh, when you run who am I, the uh, app user is returned. So uh, what does it look like to run Ansible inside of containers? Uh, this is kind of a naive um, first pass approach at it. We're going to install pip. And we're going to use pip to install Ansible. Uh, we're going to set up a directory that we're going to mount our playbooks into. Uh, oh, I already walked through all of those steps. Uh, we're going to build the image, tag it as my Ansible image. And then we're going to write a big long manual command to hopefully get everything mounted in correctly. Uh, and then we're going to try to run the and playbook command and it's gonna fail because it doesn't have the Kubernetes Python package installed. And so we might go back to our container file, um, add the Kubernetes package there, rebuild it, rerun it. Now apparently it says that there's an OpenShift module that it needs. So we rinse and repeat, add the dependency to the file, rebuild it. Now um, the task works. This works, um, you know, but it's pretty painful, um, repetitious process. Um, it would be really cool if we could make this easier. So the solution that we've come up with is called execution environments. Like I said at the beginning, um, they're container images that contain everything needed in order to run Ansible. So our hope is that this will kind of become the packaging format or the, the, the distribution format for Ansible environments. So the general workflow, um, we've created a tool called Ansible Builder, which I'll talk about here in a second, but you build your execution environments with Ansible Builder. Uh, you're gonna test your, you're gonna be able to test your execution environments locally with a tool that we've called um, Ansible Navigator, and then um, in AWX and in the, the automation platform, you're going to be able to use these to run um, your jobs in the platform. Um, so what is Ansible Builder? Ansible Builder is a CLI tool. Um, I'll show you what it looks like to use it. Um, it the, the most minimal definition of an execution environment is a, a YAML file that looks like this, by default, it'll look for an execution environment.yaml file in the current directory. 
you can override this by passing dash F or whatever. Um, the, uh, the dependencies key here has support for Galaxy, Python, and System. For Galaxy, we support requirements.yaml, which you're familiar with. Um, you know, for Python, uh, requirements.txt. Um, and for system level dependencies, there's a project from the OpenStack community called BinDep. Um, basically, it's new line delimited list of packages that gives you a way to specify different packages on different platforms. But uh, you can look into that later. I won't touch on it here. Let's go ahead and just, well, imagine that this is not a collection that only exists on the private automation hub. Um, this will be Kubernetes, kubernetes.core. We're going to run Ansible Builder build. It's going to spit out a container image. And if you look at the collections installed, it has the collection that we specified, and it also is going to have all the Python dependencies um, that we need. Um, this just goes uh, and shows you what a container file looked like a few months ago. So I'm going to skip forward. Um, this is also a little outdated, but it, it'll give you the kind of um, high level overview of, of what's going on. So we, we take the inputs that declare uh, what we call the user level dependencies. Um, collections can also uh, declare their own metadata. Um, if you look at the Ansible Builder documentation, there's a whole page on um, targeted to collection authors. Basically, under the, um, it will will look for a top level requirements.txt, a top level bindep.txt, and a top level. Uh, uh, I, I think yeah, those are the only two things that we support because Galaxy has its own way of resolving dependencies. So basically, um, what Ansible Builder does is it installs your content inside of an image. And then it's going to run an introspection command that lists out all of the dependencies that all of the collections that you've specified require in order to function properly. This will get better over time as more collection authors start to add more metadata to their collections. But in the meantime, you can do the top level user uh, dependencies over here if um, you find anything that's missing. Um, and then phase two, we install the system level dependencies and any Python dependencies, and then out comes a container image. Um, so that is a whirlwind tour of what it looks like to use Ansible Builder. I'm going to now uh, switch gears to a demo because I only have like nine minutes left um, and show you what it looks like um, hands on. So we have. A demo over here. I have an EE demo and apparently a bunch of stuff I want to clean up. Uh, all right, I accidentally just deleted my playbook, which is fine because I think I have it over here. Yep. Yeah. All right, so I have a test playbook here that's just going to do some basic Kate API calls and a apply um, some objects and start an Nginx server. Uh, if you were to run this with just Ansible core, um, you'll see that it just blows up and says that it can't resolve the modular action um, case. So uh, I'll kind of do cooking show style. Um, we have uh, AWX EE that has this same dependency in it. Um, but if you look at the execution environment .yaml, it's a little more complex. We have uh, this op option here for additional build steps. Um, you can either append them or prepend them for just tacking on um, container file steps. And then you can see that we have uh, requirements.yaml that list all of the dependencies of AWX. And then we have a bindep.txt um, that declares some we might be able to clean this up, but um, uh, this is what AWX uh, needs in order to function properly. And so to build this, you would just, uh, let me, Ansible Builder build, 
and then you could do tag and then I'll do You have a typo at the beginning. I sure do. Thank you. So this will run through and do all of the steps that I mentioned uh, in that diagram just a minute ago. Uh, fast forward, we already have an AWXEE on Quay, and I will use that. Um, the next phase of this is a tool that I had no involvement in creating, so I, I don't deserve any of the credit, but it's called Ansible Navigator. Um, we have a team of people that's been working on it for a few months. It's out on GitHub if you want to uh, look at the code. But Ansible Navigator is basically a, um, it, it's, it's a couple of things. It's a command line tool that allows you to test execution environments, and it's also a pretty cool um, terminal user interface, or, or TUI. So I'm going to uh, work on Ansible Navigator. And just to kind of get a familiar experience, um, Ansible Navigator has this mode standard out. And when I run this, um, might take a minute to pull the image for the first time. Actually, sorry, let me show you what it looks like. Um, demos, Navigator. Navigator supports this um, syntax for settings file, which is on their repo. If you go and you look up Ansible Navigator docs settings.rst, this is these are all of the settings that are um, uh, available. And in my settings here, let me make this a little bigger. I have told Ansible Navigator to use my AWX EE image, and my example uh, uses Kubernetes, so I'm mounting in um, my kubeconfig file here. So if I want to run Ansible Navigator mode standard out, and then I'm just going to run my test playbook, you'll see output that looks really familiar to Ansible, but where Ansible Navigator gets really cool is that if you run it without any arguments, you get this really neat um, curses UI. And uh, it's Vim-ish, but you can say things like images, and it's going to go out and scan your images and find any execution environments. And uh, you can see that it's found a few uh, just testing um, things that you can ignore here. But what we're going to look at is this um, Ansible runner stable 211. So we can just hit the number one. And you can see here that we can get um, just general image information. Uh, we can hit escape to go back. Uh, we can look at the uh, Python versions uh, and the collection content here. Um, if it works, it didn't, because uh, this image doesn't have any collections in it. But we can look at the Python packages and see what's available in here. So this is kind of a cool browser um, for execution environments and Ansible itself. So uh, if you want to run um, a playbook, you would just say run, and then I forget where I put it. Maybe we can add autocomplete to this someday. Um, one second, I'll just demo e test.yaml. And run test.yaml. And I think that's it. And so it's going to start running. And then when it actually, you can see all of the hosts. Right now, I'm just running on localhost. But this gives you a really nice high level view. If you have dozens or hundreds of hosts, you can drill down and to see what's happening on an individual one. So for this one, I'm just going to hit zero. 
you can see that it's almost done running all of the tasks. Um, so let's go into one that changed, number two. And you can see that we got a YAML representation of um, that task. You can also do, um, I think it's just ST for normal standard out. Um, you can type help here to see a bunch of cool stuff. Um, so let's look at the documentation for this task. So it'll actually get the execution environment that it used and give you the documentation from inside of it so that you know it's accurate. Um, and the playbook finished. I'll go over here to my Kubernetes cluster. I have a route that was created by my playbook, and it works. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of what execution environments are and how they might be useful to people. And I think I'm right out of time. So thank you all for listening to me. Thank you, Shane. Uh, we actually do have some time because we're towards the end, and there's only lightning talks left, and we don't have that many of those. So um, any questions, comments for Shane about EE or Ansible Navigator? Yeah, if you have any feedback. Um, there's you know, Ansible Builder under the Ansible organization. There's Ansible Navigator and just open issues there or um, use the mailing list to provide feedback. David says, no questions, but great presentation and demo. Thanks. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, we can move on if, if there's no further questions. Uh, we have some. Basically, it's um, like open floor for li lightning talks right now. And I think we have a ask us anything <laughs> for Lind, Molecule, and Ara. David, would you like to um, facilitate this? Yes, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I joined uh, recently because, well, uh, it's morning here in North America. Uh, so sorry for being late. Um, I talked with Soren and um, we, we discussed and thought it would be a good idea to do a kind of a, you know, figure that everyone is here. Uh, we could do an ask us anything or ask me anything uh, regarding some of the community projects, which then Molecule and are a part of. Um, we haven't um, really done uh, prepared anything formally, uh, but, you know, I would, I would open up for discussions and questions and you know, this is a good opportunity to ask us anything. Most people probably know what, what these um, projects are about, but just, you know, for the sake of clarity, one, one line description of each project. Um, sure. So I can talk about ARA and then uh, give the mic to Soren um, for the rest. Um, so ARA, uh, it stands for ARA Records Ansible. It's the parrot you might have seen around. Uh, it records uh, Ansible playbooks to uh, a local or remote database uh, with an Ansible callback plugin. Um, so because it's an Ansible callback plugin, you can integrate it with Ansible Runner. Uh, uh, Ansible, I even tested it with Ansible Navigator, and it works. Uh, so wherever you run Ansible, you can record your playbooks and aggregate uh, reports in a single location. Um, and uh, yeah, so it gives you a CLI and a web UI to browse the results of your playbooks. Um, a little bit you know, similar to uh, what Navigator does in some respects. Um, Sarin, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, Ansible Lint, uh, if the name is not uh, already self-describing, is the linter that is used by most of the Ansible users in order to find out uh, common errors in their playbooks, I would say. Um, and Molecule, Molecule is a testing framework for, um, for Ansible. Um, most for Ansible playbooks, collections, roles. So when you write content, uh, uh, probably you need to find a way to test it. And uh, Molecule does this by uh, using uh, Ansible itself. So you can write playbooks that 
are testing your playbooks or collection roles and so on. Uh, both of them are community projects. And uh, what else should I say about, <laughs> about them? Uh, they all, all these development projects are not the first thing that uh, a new user would uh, would go for it when they learn about Ansible. But once they go into, let's say, production or they start to master Ansible and really use it, one way or another, you end up needing them on your tool set. Uh, yes, yeah, so they're they're part of you know a, um, a toolbox you know for developer experience you know they they make developing and testing Ansible playbooks uh, easier or you know I like to think that it makes them it makes it easier. Um, yes, one well, one of the things that I wanted to to talk about probably we do not have everyone involved here was there were some discussions regarding. Um, the checks that the uh, Ansible Int does, because it has something like about 40 rules that it checks against. And some of them um, are questionable, <laughs> let's say. And uh, there were some discussions regarding um, what is the best approach on uh, for deciding which rules should be included or not? Because anyone can write their own rules and use them in addition to the ones that are provided by the tool. The tool itself can also have rules that are opt-in, as in they they are hosted inside the repository, but they do not run by default unless you specify them inside the configuration. Also, there are new new rules usually go as experimental, which means they do not um, raise errors. They only raise warnings. So they are reported, but uh, they will not change the, the validation result um, of the execution. So you can, you, uh, they will not break your CI pipelines, for example. Uh, and uh, one of the, the things that uh, we need to address, and maybe we uh, need to use a group of people vetting uh, new rules in order to assure that we do not have surprises, because some people are upset about, okay, I don't find this rule useful, or and others saying that, yes, I really need it, because <laughs> I use it uh, many times. Um, and um, this was one, one of the subjects. Um, I, I think getting everyone to agree on anything is an achievement oh. on its own. So <laughs> I would say it's impossible to to fi find the perfect set of uh, of rules for this. All the linters have the sim similar kind of problems, right? And this is why they uh, they ended up having like exclude lists, skip lists, and so on. Still. For uh, someone that is new, the default is important, right? Because this is your first experience. Advanced users knows how to tune it, right? But uh, if you are new and uh, you want to see, okay, what I'm doing wrong with uh, with my code, right? With my Ansible code. And it, if it does report uh, 100 issues with your code, you may spend the next uh, six months trying to fix them. And you'll be really upset if some of them are false positives. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, as any linter, it's, uh, it is not uncommon to have false positive results. Uh, the tricky bit is to um, balance between false positives and uh, the other ones. If the, um, the number of false positives is small, it's not a, it's not a big issue, right? Because you can ignore these specific uh, occurrences. Yes. Um, so, so, so let me start with a question then, yeah. Soren. Is there is there anything exciting that you can see lending in Lint or Molecule within, I don't know, the next uh, six months to a year? I think that there are no major changes to be introduced to any you know, bo both pre uh, projects are uh, major. Right, so they are not something new. They have a good number of years of history and uh, a big number of users, 
And um, one of the, uh, the things that was introduced relatively uh, recently for, um, for the linter is that we now test some of the projects, the impact of changes made to the linter on, on specific list of repositories. We have something like eight or nine uh, repositories from different teams uh, that are checked, which means that before we even merge a change to the linter. And this um, provided a, a very good protection against introducing surprises for these users. Um, so it's like um, the only thing, uh, and anyone can uh, step in uh, to, uh, to be included in, in this list, but obviously I do not think that this list will be bigger than 10, 15 ever. Uh, because it's like you cannot test the internet, right? And uh, <laughs> well, um, one thing that uh, is a requirement is that uh, you need to be a contact for, for the repository and be able to fix it if the problem is uh, inside the repository. Because obviously, change comes in into the linter, right? And underlines, let's say, that two out of these uh, 10 repositories present some new new problems, right? And you need to decide, okay, this rule is not mature enough, or this repo the problem on, on these repositories is real and it should be fixed, right? And, which means you delay um, a change to the linter and, uh, in order to be able to, uh, to, to make a decision. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy about uh, the, the su success this um, special pipeline had to, to the project. Um, it helped a lot, I would say. So we have projects from OpenStack now from various um, areas. I think, I think that's a great idea. You know, when it, there used to be a time where there would be a new Ansible Lint release and it would, it would fail a few pipelines here and there, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Gerling would, you know, say, "Hey, my my Me playbooks are, are failing now." Right. So now that we we test some of those projects, I think it's a it's a great integration test, you know, to to prevent breaking projects. Um, so props to you on that. And we pick these projects to be different. So uh, and from di different teams and different, let's say, layout or way of using Ansible. And this gives a lot of value because. Based on how uh, each one is using it, you may get, get different results. So, so for the benefit of the audience, uh, Soren, if someone has a project who thinks would be a good candidate for this, how how would they add it? Um, they uh, they can make a pull request directly to add it to the pipeline, or if they do not know where to look, the pipeline is called Echo, so um, from the ecosystem. Um, and uh, if you go to GitHub uh, workflows, you can find it because it's a separated one. Uh, okay, so so in the Ansible Lint repo in the GitHub workflows file. Yes, you can find it there because there is also you can run the tox minus e uh, echo and run it if you want locally. Uh, and it's a just a simple file that uh, defines the list of repositories because it's a playbook. It's an Ansible playbook that is cloning these repositories from master. And running the linter on them, it's not it's not rocket science, but it's uh, it's a good way to um, uh, to protect for uh, for surprises. But keep in mind that uh, no single person should have more than one. It's like I'm trying, you know, to to get. <laughs> um, and um, yes, one one of the things that happened recently. Uh, in the last six months, we added some rules which used to be inside the various projects. Some of the, let's say, long-term users of uh, of the linter had custom rules in the, inside the, their own repositories. But um, as there was a lot of um, refactoring with the linter, we found out that um, these rules were getting broken because the internal APIs were uh, were changed in the in the linter. And um, what I did was to support them to contribute uh, these rules directly to the linter. Because most of them uh, were generic, or let's say 
can easily be adapted a little bit to make them generic. Um, and uh, this is much better for them because it's like, okay, now I'm not so surprised when I upgrade the linter because it will not break my internal code, right? Because I, I no longer have the custom rules. Yep, that makes sense. Um, for uh, for molecule uh, itself, I um, I don't think I have any special special news. There is a lot of work to be done for lots of plugins. Um, uh, news since the last summit is that now we do have a molecule libvirt plugin. Um, previously, the only way to to run locally VMs was to use the um, Vagrant one. But installing Vagrant on different platforms is not so easy. It's more problematic as a project. Uh, and um, now we do have a libvirt plugin, which is kind of experimental. So it's it's quite new, but uh, it is working. At least for basic VMs and so on, it, uh, it does work. So uh, uh, what others mean, that are not already using the project may not know that molecules allows you to test ansible code with various backends right for provisioning and deprovisioning your resources so you can use containers podman or docker and vms which log for local you can use vagrant which behind usually use either libvirt or um, virtualbox or uh, libvirt and all the clouds is like uh, all the major clouds, even smaller ones, to have plugins for it, which means that it's very easy to, to run these tests and takes care of provisioning and deprovisioning uh, these resources. All right, do we have any questions in the chat? No, we don't. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to shoot them. Um, or I guess you know we're, we're kind of in an open floor, so if there's anything you want to discuss, you know it's a good opportunity to do so. Um, in the meantime, uh, maybe a little bit about Ara. Uh, there hasn't been much uh, in the past few weeks, uh, but before then there was uh, the last release, uh, one five six, which was a, a big uh, UI uh, refresh. You know, there's there's a dark theme now, uh, so if if you know uh, light themes hurt your eyes. Uh, you can switch to dark, uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, otherwise, um, sometime in the future, uh, a, f uh, a feature that we're uh, working on, uh, but it, it's kind of tricky to implement. So Ara has um, uh, details about hosts, you know, how many tasks they ran, what was the result of these tasks. Uh, it also saves host facts. So if you gather facts as part of your playbook, Aura will save those, and you can so you can see them and query them and so on. Um, so it because it has this data, uh, Aura would sh or should be able to do something like what uh, Ansible CMDB does. So Ansible CMDB uh, has a view where you see all the hosts that ran last and what was their status. You know down to what amount of memory they had, uh, because those are available as Ansible facts, right? Like Ansible mem free or you know something like that. Um, so we would be able to have um, a web page that looks a little bit like that. Um, so from uh, an API standpoint, there needs to be some uh, feature development, but you know, the the data is there. It's just you know being able to display it in a format that makes sense. It turns out that <laughs> user interfaces are hard. Um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't have anything else very exciting that I can think about right now. There is um, the VS Code extension for Ansible. So if anyone is using uh, VS Code as their preferred uh, editor, or also the VS Codium, in fact, uh, I think even a Eclipse Thea may be able to use this, uh, the extension. So look for the Ansible extension in um, 
VS Code and uh, uh, this is also another um, community project that um, is quite new, I would say, and uh, it's uh, integrating um, Densible Lint and um, schema verification. So you can get autocomplete for uh, Ansible module tasks and, uh, and so on. Sir, uh, th this extension, is it, uh, is it the one that used to exist but wasn't maintained anymore? Is it like, uh, no, what happened? Or is it a new one? It is a new one. The other one, you'll not be able to find it anymore because earlier this week, no, uh, oh no, it was, I think, on Friday, no, not this week, uh, we got uh, Microsoft to unpublish their uh, outdated extension. And if, if anyone is uh, searching on uh, VS Code Marketplace for Ansible, this would be the first answer. So, um, and uh, also has support for uh, vaulting and devaulting, meaning encrypting and decrypting uh, secrets. So you just select the text and you can uh, have a shortcut to encrypt and decrypt. Um, yes, the, the, the really old Ansible extension was unmaintained for a very long period of time. And uh, we managed to convince uh, Microsoft to unpublish it just to, <laughs> avoid the painful experience for the users. Yeah, that's why I was asking if it was a fork or a new it's one. It's not Thanks. a fork. Uh, uh, the extension was not a fork. Uh, it was so old that uh, nothing was uh, salvageable from it. Uh, also, this extension is uh, reusing YAML uh, extension that is done by, uh, by Red Hat, which provides schema verification for all kinds of YAML files. And mainly this was the main issue with the old extension was that it was in conflict with the other ones. It's like you install one and you cannot use the other ones anymore. Uh, I would paste a link to it, but somehow my Bluetooth keyboard stopped working. And um, now I, I only have the mouse and I need to get a spare keyboard. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Uh, technology. <laughs> Actually, I've, well, while we are talking about community projects, um, I have two infos or requests for comments for another or for two other projects. Um, namely, first, for um, I've or recently I've been <clears throat> working on role support for Ansible change log and Ansible. You you might have heard, or I guess you hope, <laughs> I hope you heard that. Um, Ansible uh, Core 2.11 now allows to validate role arguments with an argument spec. And um, you can also use Ansible doc to print out the information from the argument spec. And it, it can also have additional stuff like version add, description, author, similar to other plugins and modules. And I've been using that um, to allow um, new roles and collections to be detected by Ansible change log. And also for, also for um, role documentation to be created by Ansible. That's a tool which creates a doc site, essentially. Okay. And right now, these are PRs. And at least the one for the change log, I'm planning to merge soon if there are no comments. So if, if you are interested in role argument specs, you might want, and you haven't heard about that, you might want to take a look. I am more than interested links here. about oh. this, especially <laughs> for the linter. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> So, uh, Felix, I'm still not as fast as you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Felix. If uh, if you are interested to get this into the linter, I'm more than interested because this was one of the issues with uh, because the linter is made used to lint roles and uh, collections for our mm -hmm. authors. Uh, it would be a very good place to tell them to document arguments, right, and how to do it. Yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah it's, it's probably a good idea to have that in the linter as well. Um, the tricky bit is how do you detect if a role accepts an, an argument or not? Yeah, that's basically <laughs> but well uh, impossible. We can, <laughs> uh, we, can, uh, we can detect there is no metadata about this and mm -hmm. raise this as a warning. Yes, that's possible. Once you create it, we can assume that you knew what you put there, right? Yes. So uh, I mean, you, 
you can look at everything in defaults and everything which is maybe not started with a double underscore or an underscore you can like complain if it doesn't show up in the um, argument spec something like that or even compare if everything in the defaults yeah, has the same value as in the argument spec this. Uh, because I, I am aware about some really big collections of roles. For example, uh, Zul Jobs has almost 100 roles inside general purpose. And uh, they have their own policy um, with the readme file inside each role, which documents mm -hmm. arguments and the outcomes. Uh, but this is like many years before this was, was done, right? And uh, they even checked. Uh, and uh, this would be one place where we, we would want to help them uh, migrate to a standard format, right? Which helps mm. to build better documentation and so on. Yeah, definitely. My my understanding is that role arg, arg specs are optional. Uh, so I would not, you know, scream at users by default. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, um, also they don't i mean they are also kind of optional because you cannot um, assume that all your users will be using ansible core 211 or later <laughs> actually most ones will probably not at least now yes um, was yes was there an issue in in 2.10 uh the, um when role arc specs launched was there an issue that uh or um, a pull request that needed to be backported or something along these lines well, it only started in 2.11, not at 2.10. But it, there was something in 2.11.1 as opposed to 2.11.0 because the the role spec, um, the role argument spec validation 2.11.0 um, required the argument spec to be in the, I think, the main YAML file in, in meta, in the meta subdirectory. And uh, the problem is that this one is validated so you couldn't actually use the role with previous ansible versions and oh, um right today uh, pointed that out and then um for 2.11.1 um it was changed so that you can also have it in a separate file in meta argument specs.yaml and yeah so the best version to use is 2.11.1 and today or tomorrow ansible 40410 will be released and that one will contain or well will depend on ansible core 2111 so if you use that one or the, where the latest releases both of ansible and ansible core then everything will be fine um unless so unless mistaken you, you would already pick up 2111 with 4.0 today because it's a it's a lower boundary right um Yes, it, but it if you already had four zero zero installed, uh, Ansible yep. Core. Sorry, if you already had Ansible Core two dot eleven dot zero installed and install Ansible four zero zero, you won't get it <laughs> because of the lower bound. It, yeah, it's already satisfied, right? Yeah, but if you get, uh, install the latest Ansible four one zero, which will be released today or tomorrow, then you will definitely have the correct version of Ansible Core. But yeah, this is, I mean, the problem is that older versions don't really support it. So your roles still have to kind of have some kind of bit of validation maybe for all the Ansible versions. So it will take some time until you can just rely on the role argument spec. But using the role argument spec is a great idea also for documentation. Exactly. This is where I see the major benefit is like we have a, now a standard way of documenting it. Yes. Until now, we just relied on people to write somewhere a readme file describing what it does and what arguments it does receive, exactly. which is not of so much use, I would say, because it, too mm. much freedom means... <laughs> yes, exactly. You have the freedom to shoot yourself in the foot. Yes. Uh... Multiple times, in different ways. <laughs> So many ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Only if I remember how many ways to call an Ansible module is inside the playbook. <laughs> I think I know at least four or five ways of writing the same piece of code in different ways. The same task. <laughs> uh. 
<laughs> Brian knows eight ways. So I do not know enough Ansible, I guess. We should have a trivia, like a, like a quiz or something. Who, who can name all the eight ways? It's both It's both a good and a bad thing, right? The fact that it gives you this freedom, um, well, gives you the freedom of doing the things that you, you, you want to, but also gives you so many ways to shoot yourself in the foot. It doesn't force you into you know, a very specific and rigid mold you can yeah, i think you can that, do what you want yeah most of the the freedom on this is for historical reasons of mistakes where you didn't get the api right from the first attempt right and after this you introduced an, a better way of doing something and being backwards compatible you had to you know to keep maintaining the old ways of doing it uh, and uh, in time, you end up with uh, lots of ways of... Um, and the ones that I hate probably the most is the freeform calling of the modules, when you have the text in YAML. Uh, it's called baggage. Yeah, it's baggage, yes. No, I was recently looking at module snippets because I've added other snippets for other plugins. And... Uh, it shows one way of doing it, but it's by far the not the most optimal way of doing it, especially with the amount of comments that are in line. Yes, one of the things that I wanted to to introduce to the linter was a rule to recommend the stand the best way of calling, or what we aim to be, you know, the recommended of <laughs> of two thousand twenty one. <laughs> but i uh, i never had time and also i knew what kind of um, feedback i would receive from some users so i was not in a hurry to to write the rule for this that's the thing best way depends on context i mean normally the best way is yaml but sometimes the key value is better than the, the yaml expression for certain cases so th there's no best way. There's what's generically <laughs> yeah. uh, most probably a good way. <laughs> yeah. One of the things with the free form, the text form, is that it's almost impossible to validate because you would need Ansible to parse it again. Because if you write YAML, you can use a schema to validate it, right? Because you already know the types and so on. but for other stuff, it becomes if you if you work on writing on IDE support for Ansible, it's a nightmare once you end up with stuff like this with with text. Yeah, and you're presuming that the schema is uh, stable and doesn't mutate under you. For example, uh, what is it? Uh, Vars prompt it could be both a dictionary and a list. Yes, but schema can can allow both. Uh, yeah, but most don't work well that way, especially when then you need a sub schema on the list or on the dictionary. Ah, uh, yes. Usually, usually for vars, it goes to allow any object. <laughs> yeah, but then you can't define the object because that's the problem. They're both a list and a dictionary, but then the objects are different objects underneath. So you can stop at any, but then you can't validate all the way down. Now I've been looking to that for a long time trying to find a good way to do schema validation. And uh, I would have to eliminate, I don't know, a good bunch of features for that to be possible. True. And even with, with the current JSON schema specification, it's not possible to fully validate Ansible because, um, let's say, uh, scalability. So my, my last attempt is uh, is to use a 40 megabyte schema, which uh, let's say put my computer for one minute to load the schema. I, I actually have an alternative, but uh, it's too early. It's uh, a syntax validation uh, strategy. 
which basically runs through everything as the core engine would. And you're not validating against the schema. You're validating against the engine behaving as it should on everything. Yes, but integrating this with editors would be tricky. Oh, no, that, that part is the editor can only call the schema check. You won't be able to get much more, I don't know, correction than that. Uh, this is, this is where it gets different. Because yeah, no, no. when you have a JSON schema, I tested it already on VS Code. It's like you you also get autocomplete, even indication when you have something that looks like. Well, that, that's a bit where the Ansible doc can be a lot more helpful. It is. By giving you the description of the options and all that stuff. I already included description for this, and it's really cool because you 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 go you hover you with your mouse across um, an argument, and you get the name of the argument. And in the next version, it will also be able to give you a link to the documentation in a, in the hover pop up for this. I already yeah, the problem is still doesn't cover everything. Uh, and uh, to insert a, a good snippet, it, it, the Ansible doc is not the best thing. That's why I was also working on snippets. But there, I don't really see a better way of doing how it does modules. I added lookups. I added, uh, what is it, inventory sources when they're YAML files. But that is still pretty limited. We need filters and tests, which are normally the most problematic for people. And those are especially nasty. Yeah, this requires custom code. For sure. When we go to Jinja and templates and uh, this, <laughs> probably in two, three years. <laughs> That's what I've been saying for five years. <laughs> Always more time, right? Um, has anyone got anything else that they'd like to talk about today? Cool. I really appreciate everyone taking time out of the day. Yeah, um, I, I truly do mean that. Um, I know life is sort of difficult at the moment and time zones are hard. So I, I know some people that got up very late and stayed up late and also just to take time out of their day job, right? So I, I really do appreciate that. So next steps, we will get all the notes written up uh with the call to actions and all the links to the repositories the slides and different bits will go into github as well into the community repo um we'll get all that written up and shared by uh, the bullhorn twitter and we'll email out to everyone that signed up for today um the next contributor summit will be part of ansible fest i believe the call for papers has just opened um so I'd love to see lots of community talks there. I think I'll get told. No, actually, I won't get told off on this. It's much better to have talks from community users than it is from Red Hat people, right? You know, you've got the people doing, doing stuff with this day in, day out. Give us the, give us the feedback, tell us what cool stuff you've done. So the next uh, contributor summit will be uh, September. What week in September. It will be uh, remote uh, this time. Yes, around, uh, yes, so thank you. Yes, it will still be remote. So it's the week commencing the 27th of September. Um, so again, we'll put in links to all that stuff up in the bit. Uh, when we send out the things, um, we may do a two day event again. Maybe have a day one as more of a sort of introduction, new contributors, how people can help, hackathon. That's PR review day type thing, and then day two getting into some more uh, technical stuff because you know, as we've talked about, one of the goals is to try and bring in new maintainers a bit. So let's give people uh, an opportunity. Um, if anyone's people of the, uh, I know we've been through a lot of stuff today, so take the time to to mull it over. Um, please reach out to me or anyone else here. Uh, I'll see email GitHub issues. Uh, in any way, Twitter, carry pigeon, parrot, you know, whatever, again, base protocol we want to use um, and just ask for help or, or say what you'd like to get involved in, right? Um, myself and my team, we, we want to help people, right? So if people are interested in doing stuff and want some one-on-one -on -one video calls or mentoring or anything like that, or you know anyone that might be interested, you know, that's always nice to bring fresh people into the 
and to Danceable community, I like to think we're a good bunch of welcoming. Um, so please do reach out, I'd love that. Uh, we will be sending out a doc survey, sorry, a doc survey. We'll definitely do a doc survey, but that's towards the end of the year. Uh, we'll be sending out a contributor summit survey uh, soon as well, which will get your feedback on how it went today, um, which is always very important. So please do take the time for that because um, it helps. As you've seen, we use Greg to help guide us using data, which is always the better way rather than gut feel. Um, and for the next contributor summit, hopefully we'll all be on Matrix with a nice integrated video chat and poll system and all different bits there. Um, but yeah, once again, I really appreciate everyone taking the time. Uh, do keep in touch. But we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. See you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was really great. Yes, Yay. thank you. And thank especially you. big Bye. thanks to the organizers here. That was good. Thanks for attending.